Right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think it's a fairly well-established truth that um, the education system is built upon a, a Victorian foundation. And uh, Charles Dickens, over 160 years ago, uh, recognized even then that it was a flawed system. And I think it's interesting that despite the fact he was one of the greatest social commentators of his age, we have largely ignored the warnings he's given in, in a number of places, including uh, in the opening of one of his novels, Hard Times. I'm just going to read you the opening paragraph. I have that in mind as I read. Now what I want is facts. Teach these boys and girls nothing but facts. Facts alone are wanted in life. Plant nothing else and root out everything else. You can only form the minds of reasoning animals upon facts. Nothing else will ever be of any service to them. This is the principle on which I bring up my own children, and this is the principle on which I bring up these children. Stick to facts, sir. So as Mr. Gradgrind points out, the education system is built upon uh, a very specific, measurable kind of success, which today we see as being the exam system. And I think what's interesting is that, despite the passing of time, that system hasn't softened at all. In fact, it's probably hardened to the point where our young people, teachers and parents, have never been more anxious about succeeding against this very specific criteria. I don't think that there's very much an individual teacher or even an individual school can do to fight against that system at the moment. Perhaps the one thing it can do is make a conscious decision to shift its focus. I remember reading about um, disruptive thinking about a year or so into my teaching career, and uh, the example given was of the fizzy drinks industry. And it said that the fizzy drinks industry is built upon sort of three immovable pillars. That a drink has to be uh, tasty, uh, it should be cheap, and it should be sold with a kind of carefree, fun lifestyle attached to it. And I sort of thought about the many uh, fizzy drinks I've consumed over the years and ticked those off repeatedly and agreed that that seemed about right. Now, disruptive thinking aims to flip an industry on its head. So if you take that to its ultimate conclusion, it means we're looking for a drink that might not be concerned with being tasty. It could be expensive. And it sells a lifestyle that might be something like functional. And I was wondering how on earth that could be a formula for success. And you get to the end of the article and it reveals the product. And the product was Red Bull. And I, my mind was blown about how, how clever they had been in, in subverting a, a really well-established industry. Now, innovation doesn't have to be as disruptive as that example. Um, but if you look at the great examples, uh, often disruption plays a role. Think about pretty much anything James Dyson has invented, you know, a vacuum cleaner without a bag. I think my mum's mind was blown when she saw that for the first time. You know, a fan that doesn't have blades. Now, these are things that are really unsettling when you first sort of hear about them and see them, but ultimately they're really successful examples of disruption and innovation. So what can a school do to innovate and be disruptive? Well, I think it needs to ask itself the most fundamental of questions. What is a school for? So if a school isn't going to be about passing exams, what's it going to be for? If it's not a place where you go to get filled up with facts, what's it going to do? So what if a school were a place that celebrated creativity above everything else? What if a school were a place where the curriculum uh, bent around the needs and the desires and the motivations of the young people that walked through its doors? What if a school were a place where the teachers weren't the ones with all the knowledge? What would that be like? And what about, what about if a school was somewhere that actually felt relevant to the young people that came in every day? Wouldn't that be an interesting thing? Now, there's no denying that facts are a really important part of education. You know, without facts, lots of things don't make sense. Science, basically, would go off the timetable. Um, you know, facts and rules are a, a fundamentally important part of life. Because if you don't know facts and rules, you don't know what to challenge. 
and you don't know what to change, and you don't know when to break them, you know? But beyond all of that, you know, we've got to be teaching them transferable skills. Because if you consider the average child starts education in this country at four years old, okay? And they leave at the earliest at 16, and, you know, sometimes significantly after that. So that's a minimum of 12 years in education. So consider that 12 years ago, there was no such thing as an iPhone. But today, you could walk around the corner and buy an iPhone that unlocks using your face as the passcode. You know, 12 years ago, no one really talked about sustainability. You couldn't be a social media manager. There was no such thing as a drone pilot. And you couldn't be a, a, a driverless car engineer because no one had invented driverless cars yet. Okay, the point is 12 years ago, perhaps we didn't see these jobs coming. Now, YouTube is only just about 12 years old. And who would have thought then that young people would be making fairly enormous incomes just from videoing themselves in their bedrooms talking to camera? It's a remarkable thing. Um, and the thing is, we've got to be preparing them for a future where these jobs that I'm talking about might be redundant. And the, that future is unknown. Now, there are some people, and they may well be people in this room, that think we're on the cusp of a singularity, which basically means there's not going to be a lot of jobs for people because the robots are going to do them all. I'm just not sure that our young people are going to accept that future. You know, I don't think that's the, necessarily a future that they're going to want. Um, and I think our responsibility is to provide them with a toolkit that at least allows them to ask, ask that question. You know, we need to show them that they can start making decisions about their future now, and that there's a path that they can choose that might be different to the ones that we're talking about at the moment. How can we do that? Well, we can show them how to take the facts that they know and smash those together with creativity. And we can t tell them that those individual subjects they learn in sort of 35, 40 minute slots can be mixed up and blurred so that you can't tell the difference between English and science and maths and French. Yeah? And we can take the technology that they use every day outside of school and we can bring that into school and repurpose, re-educate them about what that's for. Because if technology is going to be a big part of their future, and let's face it, it looks like it is, then we have a duty, I think, to make sure they know what it can do and what the possibilities that it offers are. Because if we teach them about what is possible, then they can start to challenge that and reach for the as yet impossible, and we keep on innovating. So in my own school, uh, we have given every, uh, every pupil an iPad. And we've done that for a whole range of different reasons. Not one of those reasons was to improve exam results. You know, and I get visits from schools all around the world. They come and sit in my office, and we talk about technology. And eventually, I nudge them on to actually talk about education. And I always try and ask them why it is they want to bring technology into their school. And it's amazing the variety of answers that you get to that question. Uh, most, in a roundabout sort of way, understand that technology in a school can be a great tool for advancing learning. Some people really don't know. They just kind of feel like they should, because that's the way things are going. Some people come in because they've got, they want it to be a unique selling point that another school can't offer. And some people really do think that it's going to be a kind of magic bullet. And the truth is, you know, technology doesn't change anything on its own. It doesn't make a poor teacher a good teacher. It doesn't make an unmotivated pupil a motivated pupil. It only works when it's part of a bigger picture, um, a bigger picture of innovation and engagement. So we've got iPads in the classroom. And what that means is our students can do things that those of us sitting in this room uh, could only have dreamt about when we were at school. You know, impossible things are now possible in the classroom. But also, they can do things the way that we do things in the world of work. Because how often in the world of work do you get asked to sit in a room in silence with no access to the digital world so that you can write down everything that you know about photosynthesis or the final act of Othello? You know, in the real world, you get asked to present, you get asked to research, you get asked to create. You know, and at the tip of your fingers is that digital world with all sorts of inspiration available to you. 
Um, we have um, a GCSE Italian class, and they've been really helped along their journey over the last two years because they conference call a school in Italy. And that means that 15 and 16 year old boys and girls in England are speaking, learning a language from 15 and 16 year old boys and girls in Italy. And it probably comes as no surprise that they take that quite seriously. Because it's one thing for your teacher to sort of point at you and say, you know, talk for 30 seconds about what your favorite food is in Italian. It's another thing entirely when that question or something similar comes from somebody your own age. You know, that interaction really matters. And on the, on the matter of interactions, the other thing that we've had to do is, is renegotiate what technology is for. And that's been a conversation with students and with parents. So if any of you have got a teenager, I'm sure you're very familiar with their face, uh, but in particular, you're probably quite familiar with their face as lit from underneath with a sort of stark bluey white light, usually seen in the middle of the night when you thought they'd been asleep for two hours and you hear a strange beeping noise that alerts you to some strange activity in their room. So it's no, it's no great secret that you know, young people like technology and in particular social media. You know, I guess social media is kind of like what rock and roll was to kids in the 50s. You know, it's this sort of secret language that adults aren't supposed to fully understand. And so what we've had to do is, is, is sort of show them this technology from a different perspective. You know, so what we've done is we've shown them that, that that phone or that tablet or that laptop can be a tool for creating content, not just passively receiving cat videos. It can be a tool for problem solving rather than escapism. And it can be a tool, most importantly, for learning. You know, it can be a tool for learning rather than just entertainment. And we've taken our parents on that journey as well. You know, so every year we invite them in for an evening and we give them an iPad and we sit them down in our hall and we teach them a lesson, not in a sinister way, but we sit down and they, they sort of do an English lesson or a maths lesson and they use the technology in exactly the way um, our children do. And they walk out of our, our school feeling inspired and a bit jealous of all the cool things that their children can do. But they really understand what it is we're trying to achieve uh, with technology. Over the summer, I launched a, a coding competition, which I cleverly called Summer of Code. Um, the premise of it was really simple. It was an optional activity, and um, the children had to go away and create a game or an app. And the only guidance I gave them was a theme, which was the planet Earth. And there was a deadline, and there was a promise of a prize for the top three entries. That was it. And I think the thing I need to tell you is the entries that came back were just amazing. Uh, the headmaster and I got to sit in his office playing games. You know, we were trying to get high scores, uh, not die, power up, level up, all the sort of things you expect from a really good game. And it sort of struck me, we didn't really teach them how to do that. But more strikingly, we didn't teach them to do the thing that they did next. I found that two out of the three uh, top three entries had already monetized their game. <laughs> yeah. One was listed on Kickstarter, and he'd, ra he'd raised a, a goodly sum, and the other was already on the App Store, along with about a dozen other apps he'd already, he'd already created, making money through advertising. That was just astonishing. You know, that, that sort of self-taught innovation was amazing. So there's no doubt in my mind that the Summer of Code was a success. But I didn't feel like it was quite finished. I thought there was more we could do. So we've now got a group of students building, that right now, building a classic six-foot arcade machine. And that machine is going to play the games of those, those winning entries. And the machine's got a coin slot, and it's going to stand somewhere in school, and it's going to raise money for charity. The kid's going to play games, it's going to raise money for charity, and that's amazing. Um, and for me, that project has been the embodiment of innovation, really. It's brought together a really diverse group of people, you know, uh, different ages, different genders, different skills. We've got coders doing the interface. We've got people doing technical drawings, musicians writing a score, um, oh, just all sorts of different things going on. And we've also got wannabe economists tracking every single penny that we spend. And at the end of it, once we've built it, they're going to tell me whether or not there's a viable business at the end of it. And if there is, then even more people get to be involved with marketing and business planning and web design. For me, that, that is innovation. 
You know, Some of those are, are skills that we have taught them, and some of them are skills that they've taught themselves. I'll be the first to admit, I do not know how to build an arcade machine. You know, I know Dickens. Um, I couldn't code as complex a game as they have coded. But it turns out I don't need to. What I needed to do was show them how to take the facts that they knew and apply them in a creative way. I needed to get them to collaborate in a space where they felt free to challenge themselves and make mistakes and just get on with it. And that's how the innovation happened. Um, so, you know, innovation in education is, is a really essential thing. The, 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 the world that they become adults in is not our world. You know, and we have a responsibility to try and help them navigate that path. But we also have a responsibility, I think, to make sure that they see what education could and should be. It should be something collaborative. It should be something creative. It should be something that celebrates the blending of facts and skills. And it should feel relevant to them at all times. And it should also allow them to engage with technology in a meaningful way. <coughs> so, in other words, one Elon Musk is great. But we need more people with big ideas and the wherewithal to see them through so that the future is not written by an elite group of visionaries, but by everyone. Thank you.